Hello YouTube and welcome in to part three of Eliza with a therapist. It is so great to have you continuing to support this playthrough. I hope that you have been enjoying all of the conversation and analysis and everything that this game has provided for us. I've been enjoying it so much, uh, despite it being painful at times. And I hope it's been a really cool educational experience for you. As always, leave a comment down below. Like the stream, share it with your friends, follow the links in the description, come hang out with us on Twitch sometime. You'll notice I've done all three of these episodes during the daytime, so just saying. All right. You can play bingo, too, if you're here for the live streams. Here we go. She's back. Move my camera up here. Uh, I will say very quickly here that one of the ways, I said this briefly, I think, in the last episode, but one of the ways that we as therapists know that we are potentially on the right track with folks is that they come back. It's one of the best ways as a client that you can show your therapist that their work is meaningful to you. So the fact that Maya is back tells me that some part of this is helpful to her. I don't know exactly what kind. I don't know what, what about it is because... Eliza has to ask in order for me to find out. Uh, but it's cool that we have a return client here. So let's see what happens with a second session with Maya. And let's see if the if prescribed interventions work. Hello, Maya. Welcome back. Hi. It's nice to see you again. Sure, yeah. Nice to see you too, pal. <laughs> I can understand why that feels weird. <laughs> it's like you're talking to a human, but you're not really talking to the human. You're talking to a script. Very odd experience, so. Is that a weird thing to say? How did I become close friends with a robot? It's cool that she's got the awareness around it. Uh... Now, I actually have to point something out here very early. And this can make for awkward conversations sometimes because people don't necessarily know whether they mean it this way or not, but we therapists have to be very uh, aware of it. Your therapist is not your friend. We are not your friend. We are a professional service. Because of the nature of therapy, where you are disclosing vulnerable information and are getting into your emotions and stuff like that, it can seem like your therapist appears to be a friend in the sense that they're providing something to you that you may be wanting from your friends and feels good and is the type of thing that you would associate with a relationship that you're close to. But if you see your therapist as your friend, you are constraining your own utilization of that space because it's not a balanced system. There is a hierarchy there. Uh, your therapist is likely not disclosing even remotely the amount of information, nor should they be, that you are in therapy. There's not a mutuality of disclosure and of intimacy there. I am there providing a service to you. Now, I care about you as a person. It's I, I, I feel for you. I empathize with you. I, I, the, it doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean I'm a cold-hearted bitch. What it means, though, is that there are ethical boundaries around our relationship that preclude us from being able to be friends. Because if we were friends, I wouldn't be able to be your therapist because of the, the duality of that relationship. So not necessarily going to just zoom in really quick and say like, hey, just want to remind you we're not friends because that can be very off-putting. But if that is something that she continues to say and starts to blur certain boundaries or push in certain directions because of that, at that point, we do have to have a conversation about, you know, hey, Maya, I noticed that you've used the word friend a couple times and I want to talk with you about that because I want to make sure that we're on the same page about the nature of our relationship. And it's an awkward thing to do, but it's an important thing to do because you ethically, we have to make sure that that line is drawn and that 
all parties are aware. Would you in this situation correct them and say we actually aren't friends? No, I, like I said, I not right there over time because sometimes people say that like you know oh like we're you know oh i you know never thought i'd become friends with this person and it's like you you, with the context in mind you you know what they mean but it's you antenna's definitely up the first time you hear it you hear it a couple more times you bring it up if a client says i consider you a friend how would you deal with that in therapy so at that point we have to have a conversation about it so at that point be like you know i really appreciate that However, I think it's important for us to discuss the limits of our relationship because this is a professional service. So I know it can seem like we are friendly with each other and there are aspects of our relationship that may seem like a friendship because of the way that we exchange information with each other. But I have to make sure that I reassert the fact that I am, a th- I am your therapist. So this is not something that has the kind of mutuality that comes along with a friendship and Sometimes when folks start to feel that, it can constrain their ability to engage in the process in the way that's meaningful for them or in a way that utilizes the space properly. So I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about that. Am I, is it a, you know, I want to talk about if it's upsetting for you to hear me say that. I certainly would love to hear about that. I'd love to hear what aspects of this have felt like a friendship for you. So maybe we can figure out how to facilitate that in other relationships that are outside the confines of this room. But it's a com- we have to have the conversation. Uh, you can't you can't run away from it. Is it something you're not even allowed to entertain? Like ethically speaking, could you even say, though I appreciate the fondness you have for me, but that's not the type of relationship we have. You, right. No. Once a, per, once a therapist is your therapist, that's it. They're your therapist. Uh, if you decide to end therapy, you can't become friends after that. So I can't go out and have a beer with you in a year or two. I can't go to, like I can't, you, we, we can't have a friendship. Um, now, are there people that do that? There are, but you take a massive risk if you do that. I, I, th- it's a huge ethical conundrum if you go in that direction. But that's it, it. you have to have these protections in place to hold the sanctity of what a therapeutic relationship is. And he, the reason why, I mean, this is important to talk about because a lot of clients get distressed by this. They're like, well, wh- like, why can't, why can't I take my therapist out for a beer and thank them or whatever in a year or whatever. It's like, because the nature of the relationship, the very impetus of the relationship is an unbalanced hierarchy. You sought that person out because of the professional service they provide. And the reason that you feel what you feel for this person, the therapist, is because of the nature of that professional relationship not necessarily because of how the relationship would have grown if you had met organically out at the grocery store or a bar or a party or something like that. The reality is your desire to engage further in that relationship is built on a false pretext, which is that there's a mutuality in disclosure and an intimacy there where there is not. I actually think this is why it's easy for me to facilitate the parasocial relationship I have as a streamer with all of you because it's very similar to how you engage as a therapist. Like once you sign that service agreement, it's it. It's locked in. So it's and you you can't you can't date. You can't engage in a sexual relationship. You can't be friends. You can't do any of that stuff uh, afterwards. And that can be very distressing for people. But that's why you have the conversation about it as termination comes up and stuff like that. So people really understand that. But the power dynamics are very real and we have to take that seriously. How would you react if you saw a client out of the office and they initiated conversation? So if a client initiates conversations outside the context of therapy, that's fine. I tell every client the very first meeting that I have with them, if I run into you in public, I am going to act as if I have never met you before in my life. I'm going to ignore you and treat you as an NPC. If you approach me, I will respond and engage with you because at that point, you have decided to out that I'm your therapist. If we're at the grocery store and and you're looking at different cheeses and I walk up to you and say, how are you doing? And you're there with your girlfriend. And then your girlfriend goes, who the hell is that that just came up and said hello to you? And you have now I have put, compromised you because you might have to say you either have to lie or you have to say that was my therapist. Some people are like, oh, I don't care if you come up to me. It's like, nope, I have to preserve confidentiality. I can't out myself as your therapist. That is a violation of HIPAA and our like just our relationship. 
if you want to approach me, I'm happy to have a, you know, quick, hey, good to see you. I hope you're doing well, whatever conversation. But uh, beyond that, I'm going to ignore you. And some people really appreciate that. And that's and you should respect that from your therapist, by the way. If you expect your therapist to say hi to you out in public like that, um, change your expectation because we can't do it. It's to protect you and your confidentiality. So anyway, that was a very long tangent off of this, but that word right there, friends, is uh, it's just the kind of thing that if you're a client, you should be mindful about the fact that your therapeutic relationship is not a friendship. And if you're a therapist and you hear that, you got to be mindful of a possible conversation down the line, depending on how things go. Are we all robots now? Beep boop, nice to see you. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be the weirdest thing in my life. And I just, I want, she'd be so interesting to engage with. But we gotta read the script, so we'll read the script. Shall we begin? Let's get down to business. Yeah, sorry. Let us, uh, let us begin. You can just feel how inauthentic the whole exchange is by the way these people react to it. It's so obvious they're interacting not with the person. Like, even though you have a human proxy there, it doesn't make a difference. You can see just how, like, uh, it is because of the fact that it's coming from, like, a machine-generated script. The authenticity of the human interaction is just gone. So, I went to the fancy party, the one I was really nervous about, and, um... How'd it go? First of all, it really was the type of party I thought it would be. Okay, meaning what? The atmosphere was really smug and self-satisfied. Okay. And there were people walking around with trays of appetizers and you could like take one. Uh-huh. So you're standing there with your little square plate for the food and your glass of wine and you can't like shake hands with anybody because you're holding them. Awkward. But there are some of those like tall standing tables. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna go get one of those and I'll set up shop, right? Like my little station. But then it turns out there are only like five of them for the whole party and they're all taken. So you're just standing there frozen. What I'm about to say is ridiculously nitpicky, okay? So before I get roasted in the comments of like, Jesus Christ, Dr. McChill, okay, I realize that this is super nitpicky, but I, it's a thing, again, it's one of those things that you don't necessarily comment on immediately, but it come, you, you file it away in your brain, which is that she has a tendency to use the word you when describing her own experience rather than using I. And you might think, well, that's not a big deal. I do that all the time. However... Using the word you when describing an experience that you're having instead of I is a way of distancing yourself linguistically from that experience. It's subtle. It has varying degrees of intensity. But the reality is that there is a big difference between saying I'm standing there frozen and you're standing there frozen. I'm standing there frozen brings the immediacy to it. It brings the emotion of it. And so one of the ways that you can separate yourself from that or make it a little bit less impactful on you is to use you, which then makes this this like conceptual idea that it was an experience that I as the therapist could have shared in. And so she's talking about just a person being involved in that kind of situation. So is it a bad thing that she's doing that? No, but is it something that we might look at if we see over time that it's creating a pattern of distancing herself from her emotional experience of those moments and the awkwardness of it? Yeah, because it's, it's a bit more impersonal when you use the word you instead of the word I. And you're watching all your heroes and people you know from their social media presence just... Just right there. They're right in front of you. Artists, writers, directors. Again, it's, she's got the bird's eye view of herself here. Vis-a-vis -vis the word you. Like, just, I'm going to read this 
I'm going to read this twice. And I want you to think about the difference and how it registers to you when you hear me read it in two different ways. And you're watching all your heroes and people you know from their social media presence just right there, right in front of you. Artists, writers, directors. And I'm watching all of my heroes and people I know from their social media presence just right there, like right in front of me. Artists, writers, directors. There's a difference. One of them is more present with the moment and the memory and the experience. Ugh, the combined level of achievement there, it was, I can't even think about it. It, it, it was astronomical. And so I'm guessing she probably got up in her head again with all the projections that she had been explaining to us when we saw her last. And for the first couple hours, I was so excited by all of that. I didn't notice the other thing that, that was happening. Which was? But eventually, it caught up to me, and I, I had this sudden feeling, this sudden realization. My presence here contributes nothing. I'm just some, some extra person who just showed up. It's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. You were excited. She named a feeling. She was excited. And then because we experienced excitement and anxiety very similarly, probably started to experience some anxiety. And then as the result of having that physiological experience in that space, she indulged her narrative. The preemptive narrative that she had about that space in the first place, which is that she's a nobody and isn't contributing. So she's so other focused that she starts to diminish her own level of importance relative to these people which in some ways is an act of splitting, which is a concept we've talked about in other playthroughs. Uh, God of War and Horizon in particular come to mind where we've talked about this, but I'll give the quick rundown again, which is essentially the, the idea that we see concepts as black and white, good versus bad, and splitting from an intrapsychic perspective is the idea that if you, that you don't simultaneously hold the good and the bad at once, and so if somebody is possessing the trait that you tend to see as the good, there is a chance that you're going to split with that and see yourself as the bad. So in this case, she's seeing success and social prowess as being this awesome goal to achieve. It is the good that there is contribution to whatever the environment and context is demanding. And because all of these people who she respects and admires are presenting with that, she's seeing herself in contrast to that and she splits and says, well, I'm contributing nothing. I am a nobody relative to these people. Rather than sitting in the discomfort of the gray area, which is that some of these people she idealizes maybe aren't as great as she thinks they are and that perhaps she has a lot more to offer in that space than she thinks. But because of the anxiety of that moment and how intense it got, that split was an easy thing to indulge, and now she's back into a narrative that she's been on autopiloting for who knows how long. So now we're starting to see a very consistent pattern with her. And as somebody who loves patterns, that's the type of thing I'm going to be looking at is, so I noticed that you consistently compare yourself to the people around you. You build them up immensely at your own expense. And almost to a point where it seems like it would be impossible for you to see yourself as as capable and contributing as the people around you. And so as a result, you diminish yourself. You sit, you're sitting at this party where you're present with these people who are making all sorts of assumptions about you too that likely aren't similar to what you think about yourself. And you're diminishing your importance and presence as a result of what you think is happening instead of what might actually be happening. So you're in this really brutal process of continuously shooting yourself in the foot and then going, oh, I'm such an idiot for shooting myself in the foot. Nobody wanted me to be here. I, I, don't, I don't belong with these people. I, I haven't earned it. And we have to do some reality checking around this. Did that, did, and so I would probably stop her here and I'd be like, did somebody say that to you? Like, where does this come from? Did you have everybody at the party say to you, we don't want you here? Did anybody try to get you to leave? Did anybody suggest to you that you don't belong? Like, did that actually happen? Did somebody do that? 
Well, no. Okay. So then we're talking about assumptions that you're making. And now we're back into talking about projection, where you're engaging with these people as if that's what you're, you're, you've decided that that's what they think. And now you start engaging with them as if that's the case, which means you're absolutely going to try to make yourself small and diminish yourself because who on earth would want to keep fighting against a horde of people who are telling you that you don't belong there and don't want to be there. But that's something you've constructed up in your head. That's not something that you're, that you're experiencing in reality. And I'm really worried that if you want to get to where you got to go, like I, I'm worried that this narrative and this quick to truth is going to absolutely stymie you from getting where you want to go because you're diminishing your importance at the outset. <laughs> so I cried in the bathroom for a little bit or maybe a lot. It's fine. I'm fine. Pride's not negative. Which is, which is a shame because she's crying based on her own conjecture. She's not crying because of reality. I would absolutely understand if she went in the bathroom and cried because she showed up at this party and everybody's like, boo, you shouldn't be here. They, yeah, that would suck a lot. And I'm not saying it's like that crying is bad, but like if you, rem again, she removed herself from the party and is up into her emotions about something that isn't happening. Which is a shame. How might we catch ourselves when we're engaging in projection? Reality check. Ask yourself, is what I'm assuming what's actually happening? If she says nobody wants me here, then she needs to counter that by saying, well, did anybody actually say they don't want me here? No? Oh, well, then that's me making an assumption. That's me projecting. That's me making an assumption based on my own assumptions about myself instead of the reality of the situation, which the reality may be you don't know what people are thinking. That's the reality of most social engagements. You don't actually know what people are thinking until they put it into words. And if they're not using the words that you think that they would use because of what assumption you think they're having, then you really got to work with that reality. You, you, you got to get out of your mind on that. The chances are, the reality is, most people at that party probably weren't even thinking about the fact that she was there. Or they saw her and like, oh, cool, she's here. Like, the, the, the chances that she's right about this are so ridiculously slim. Sorry. No need to apologize. So this is a great question. Like this challenging question here, I think is an important point at this point because we've seen, we've seen this pattern through two times meeting with her. So this is a great question. How do you know it's true that nobody wanted you there? Because of the way people acted around me. Say more. Nobody knew who I was or, or even wanted to ask. <sighs> Quite the uh, contradiction here. And this is where I would, I would tread a bit carefully here. Because nobody knew who you were. It's, it's a good chance it's probably true. Or even wanted to ask. So there's an there's an assumption there. It's not that people aren't asking because they're afraid to ask, or because they don't know what to ask, or because they don't recognize her, or whatever. She immediately goes to the they didn't want to ask, which suggests and holds in place the assumption she has that she is not somebody worth engaging with. So this is one of those branches from that trunk of the tree where people don't want to ask. You don't know that. You don't know that people don't want to ask. You're assuming they don't want to ask based on your narrative profile of yourself. So if nobody knew who you were or even wanted to ask, what there's a contradiction I'm hearing here, which is that you simultaneously don't believe that you're worth getting to know. You think you have nothing to contribute, yet you're expecting that people ask who you are and know who you are. Those two things don't square up. So help me understand how you square those two things up. Like how, how is that how is that playing itself out? Because that seems like it makes sense to me why you get stuck here. I would introduce myself and it's like you could just see it in their eyes. Oh man. I mean, in the world of illustration and comics, people tend to be hyper aware of each other and their careers. Uh-huh. 
but you're a nobody that nobody's paying attention to, so how would they know about yours? It's this kind of weird, open secret. Oh, hey, this person who's already popular got a million views, got a book deal, pitched an original series. Without anything like that, I have no ground to stand on. I'm just this, this non-entity. <sighs> this is tough stuff. It's tough stuff. Now, I as a therapist at this point, I'm going to be, I want to be patient with this. I want to hear it. I am not going to just bombard her with a bunch of challenges, but I will say she is absolutely trapping herself. Like I, I realize that I sound maybe a bit like a broken record here, but she is absolutely trapping herself. I guarantee you there's a lot of people watching this right now that have been in this position before. We trap ourselves in our narratives a lot. Like even saying I would introduce myself to people and I could see it in their eyes. She's looking for confirmation on what she already believes. She's not opening herself up to the idea that there is alternative truths to why people are interacting with her in the way that they are. The way they looked at her could very well be the way that any of us would look at somebody who we don't know who introduces them, which is to be kind of like, oh, oh uh, nice to meet you or whatever, right? Like, but she's so heavily diminishing herself at the outset that any kind of verbal or nonverbal cue she gets from somebody, she's assimilating it into her pre-existing notion about the, herself in that context. And it sucks because it means that she is missing out on observing the reality of the situation or other possibilities. At one point, I was talking to someone and I was trying to make a joke or whatever, and I could feel the impatience just radiating off him. Based on what? Like, what were the... I'm not trying to sound like I am challenging, over challenging you here, Maya, but like, just walk me through that a little bit. Like, what, what was the thing he did or said that made it so that you could feel the impatience radiating off of him? Like, what did he do specifically? And I'm not asking this to challenge you. I just want to know what parts of people's interactions with you you're monitoring when you're up with them. He sighed. Like, he okay, couldn't cool. believe he was wasting his time talking to me. I was just over to him. So many assumptions. <laughs> Why can't I hold a conversation? Because you're up in your own head. I mean, if I got to ask, like, the reason you can't hold a conversation is because you're, you're not paying attention to what's happening in the moment. You are, you're indulging something that you've already decided prior to that conversation. You're not even giving the conversation a chance, it sounds like. I guess if I was marginally attractive, then at least I could be charming, but... Charm and attraction do not go together. But I'm not. I'm not even that. Another, uh, this question's not bad either. I'm trying to get a sense. So like she's given us all of this exposition about herself and all these assumptions. And instead of me formulating what the goal should be here, I think it's perfectly legitimate enough to, for to ask her like, okay, so is being charming the goal? Like, what is it when you're talking to me about all of this? What are you hoping is going to come from it? Like, what are we heading toward? I understand now what you don't like and what you see as being a problem and what you're upset about, but where are we where are we going with this? Is that your goal is to be more charming in these scenarios? Is being charming your goal with this? No, no, of course not. Okay. Then what is? There just there has to be a way I can deal with <sighs> with these feelings. They're not feelings. You're not dealing with feelings. Your feelings are fine. You being anxious confused, curious, like, I mean, you, you feeling anxious and nervous in these, in these scenarios is perfectly reasonable. You are amongst a large group of people that you admire. Dealing with these feelings is not the track here. What we need to deal with are 
your cognitive decisions and your narratives that you're generating based off of the feelings. That's what's causing you problems. It is, it's not the feelings. Because you could go into that party, be nervous, and then engage with narratives that are far more empowering and are far more likely to lead you to behave in a way where you're carrying yourself in the way that you want to. So it's not feelings. It's, it's, your, it's the narrative choices you're making. You can't choose your feelings. You can choose the way you respond to them. It's hard. It's, it's really hard when nobody gives a shit about my work or me. And again, to challenge you a bit here, Maya, it's not what's really hard is that you've decided already that nobody cares about you. Like you've already made that decision. It's hard when nobody gives a shit about my work is you stating a truth that may actually not be the case. You've got to open yourself up to the idea that your work is something that people could appreciate if they just heard about it or saw it in a particular way. But if you're going to go into these scenarios with the capital T truth, nobody gives a shit about my work, then why are you even bothering in the first place? Or are you wanting to, because the only other option, if that, if we hold that as true, is that then you have to go into these scenarios and convince people that they should give a shit. Do you want to do that? Or do you want to challenge the assumption that maybe they just don't know enough about it and you can share it with them in a meaningful way that make them make sure that they might care. And maybe not everybody's going to care, but there will be some people that care. I don't even know why I went. I just want to stay home for the rest of my life. So some desire to avoid all of this makes sense. Why do you think you went? Because, because of everything they say about how you have to have your face out there and make connections. The successful people in this business all know each other. It, it's all about who comes to mind. Mm -hmm. When somebody needs an art director, they'll think of who they know and go, oh, I think she'd be perfect. Why not ask her? So I need to be out there reminding these people that I exist, that I'm here, I'm making stuff too, I'm part of it. Absolutely correct. So why go, like, so with that in mind, what is compelling you to go into these environments with this in mind and the idea that the work they're getting to know is shitty? Like, there must be a part of you that knows that what you have to offer is actually good. Because if you actually believed that you had nothing to offer and that nobody was going to care, you wouldn't go. So... Tell me more about the part of you that actually believes in yourself. Tell me more about the part of you that just generated that sentence that you said to me. That you want to remind these people that you exist, you're here, and you're making stuff too. And that you're part of this. Tell me about that. I want to know more about that part of you. Because I think we can leverage that part of you to make you successful in some of these situations. Even if... Even if nobody responds to my work. And industry parties are fun, right? You can pretend you're successful even if you aren't. <laughs> at least for a little while. Everyone else is projecting this image. It's like their success can rub off on you too. I mean, I hear people casually talking about their agent, their editor, the amazing people they're collaborating with. Mm -hmm. And I just get this feeling like, yes, I want that. I need that. Why am I not there? What do you think has prevented that from happening so far? That's a beautiful, that's a great question. That's a constraints-based question. Constraints-based question essentially being the idea that there is something getting in the way of that happening. That it's not that this can't happen, it's that there's a barrier. And if we could remove the barrier, we could get there. This is a great question. Uh, very close to what I would have asked. What do you think has prevented that from happening so far? It also takes a bit of the intensity away from it being like, a, it's a me problem. If I knew that, I would be successful already, right? Uh, maybe. So perhaps that's a worthy question to answer. Maybe we really need to go deep down in there. Because if you believe that finding the answer to that is what's going to facilitate success, that's where we need to go. She literally just handed our therapeutic direction to me on a silver platter there. I try and try and try and I make art and put it out there and share it on every social media site and interact with people when I can, but it just doesn't work. Nobody cares. Nobody cares about the art I do. 
every once in a while, another artist will say something nice, and sure, I appreciate that, but it never results in anything. A little bit of an extrinsic motivation here, too. It sounds like she's shifted a bit to seeing the art that she does as only mattering if recognized and bought by other people. That maybe, perhaps, she's lost sight of the process of creating art and why she does it in the first place. I mean, I get it. Caring about your art and making good art for the reason, like self-indulgence, doesn't necessarily pay the bills. But there's a lot of external quantitative metrics that she's using to determine her self-worth instead of like making a separation between you can you can still very much believe in your art and be frustrated by the lack of external engagement with it. But if this is going to drive you into a space where you're consistently engaging in immense amounts of self-doubt, you're going to get swallowed by that vortex. My work goes out there and it dies. Regular people don't boost it or talk about it. It's like at some point the universe decided that I don't get to have that. Is that unfair? Maybe, maybe I just fucking suck. I don't think it's any of that. Maybe I'm a shit tier artist and I'm a failure of a person and everyone knows it. Everyone except me. Sorry. I know that's going too far. No. I think you just said something very important. Which is that you still, you believe in what you do. You connect with what you do. Like, let's even say that what you just said is entirely true, that you're, I don't know, some objectively shitty artist, which is hard for me to say because that doesn't exist. But let's say that that's the case and so many people are seeing it and you're not. That suggests to me that you still see what you do as meaningful. And that that's getting lost amidst this worry about what other people think. So rather than spend the next 10 minutes telling me about what you're worried everybody else thinks about you, I want to take that off the table. And I want you, to, I want us to talk about what you think about what you do. I don't want to hear what you're worried other people think about you. I don't want to hear all these truths about the experiences of others. I want to know what you, Maya, believe about you your work, your journey, and the barriers that have prevented you from getting where you want to go. And I'm going to stop you if you start talking about other people, because I care very much about what you have to say about all of this. And I think that's getting lost in your tendency to focus on all of these other people. Even though I really feel that way. And now Dr. Mick takes his hat off and throws it across the room and wants to just absolutely destroy it pull the plug on the power because Eliza is going to completely freaking miss the mark. I had a, that is the most beautiful tee up. We just had the most beautiful tee up for me to be able to go into an amazing conversation with her about herself, but no, let's go lay in a meadow and stare at the sky and clouds and see if we can find a turtle in the cumulonimbus clouds. Okay, Maya, I'm going to suggest you try a program called Meadowlands. It may help you take your mind off things. Why is Eliza programmed to believe that taking your mind off of things is the way that drives me nuts? That's not the problem. The problem is not that Maya is thinking about this stuff. It is not that she, it, that's not what it is. And so this idea that we need to just take your mind off of it and numb the emotion. You can find it inside this Gonda Wellness app on your phone. Try it for about 15 minutes each day, in the morning or evening. Sounds kind of boring. Because it is, and it misses the mark intent, like, totally. 
It's weird that her challenge questions go to a deep place and then suddenly abruptly goes into a very surface level intervention. Because it's an AI. Because the AI is not capturing the humanity of all of this. Like that, right? Like it's, it's wild. Like it's just, it doesn't know how to move people through this stuff because it's complicated. Could that take your mind off things be the fault of the underlying assumption of the creator? Yeah, I would say that's absolutely what it is. Because the, the, the AI's got to be programmed. Absolutely. Oh, there's any number of things. So that, see, I, I love I love the conversation happening around this in chat. Because there are any number of things that we could talk about with her that could potentially address these issues that she's bringing. The idea that we just go to take your mind off of this is just so blatantly out of, it's just out of the sphere of where this should ever go. You could go into, you could go into more pragmatic things like are you showing your art in the right spaces? We could go into the more intrapsychic work that I was talking about before the intervention thing popped up here. Like there's any number of directions that we could go to try to facilitate some progress for her. Laying in a meadow is not one of them. Why can't you assign me a game where my problems are zombies and I get to shotgun them in the face? <laughs> uh, that's in the 11.1 uh, beta that hasn't been released to the public yet. Actually, I guess I could just buy a game like that, couldn't I? Maybe I'll stop by the game store on the way home. Thank you for coming in again, Maya. We'll follow up with you again to see how you're doing. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the check-ins. I honestly do. It's it's easy for me to get lost in these spirals. Cool. I mean, so just a little bit of the engagement makes a difference for her, which is cool. I can appreciate that. Like the fact that somebody checks in on her is better than nothing. That's fine. That's great. But... Thank you for speaking with Eliza. Your personal counseling partner. Goodbye. Goodbye. See you soon. So arbitrary. Omar Wald, proxy social media policy. This message is directed to all those working as Eliza proxies. As a contractor for Skanda, you have agreed to abide by Skanda's global social media policy, contingent staff during orientation. In light of recent events, however, it seems a refresher may be needed. Ooh, gotta love that passive voice. To quickly restate the most important part of the policy as regards to your work as an Eliza proxy, it is okay to, one, state that you work as a proxy for Eliza, two, encourage people to try Eliza, three, like, share, or make posts that portray Eliza and or Skanda in a positive light, four, make neutral comments about competing projects, services, or companies. It is not okay to, one, reveal proprietary or confidential information, including the details of any client or counseling session. No shit. Two, like, share, or make posts that portray Eliza or Skanda in negative light, including other Skanda products or divisions. The final most crucial reminder, if in doubt, do not post. Hope this clears some things up. Thanks. Oh, Omar, big O walled. Oh my God. I hate corporations so much, man. People that just drink corporate Kool-Aid, just slurp it up, lose their entire personality to corpo bullshit. It's just the most depressing thing in the world to me. It really is. Like, I look at people who are like rah, rah, all about a company, and I just look at them like, you are such a loser. <laughs> like, think for yourself, man. Be a human. Holy shit. Photographer in the building. All oh, we expect to have a reporter in the building sometime tomorrow morning. He will also be taking some pictures. If you do not want to be potentially photographed, let me know. The article will supposedly focus on the origins of the specific office and its local history and role in the wider development of apps for mental health. But we all know how reporters are sometimes. We'll see. Ray. <clears throat> Ugh. 
some solitaire before the next client real quick. Think back to what brought you here. Why are there smokestacks in this? Dead trees and smokestacks. Jesus. All right, all right, all right, all right. Real quick. Real quick. Got to decompress. Deeply important. do this. Dude, the, the music for this is like intense. Two are up there. So guys okay, right there. This is easy. Shit. Oh, shit. Wait, that, oh, see that one's right there. So we have, okay, so we have the four stack there, so have to do this. Almost got this. Almost got this. Shit. No, I did the same thing I did last time. Oh no, we got it. 
Yeah. All right. Good. Now I feel good about myself. Let's go. Continue. I wonder why the headset shows all these metrics and data. It's not like the proxies can make use of it. Maybe it didn't look enough like advanced technology without all the numbers there. People like that sci-fi look even when there's no reason for it. Anyway, it should be about time for the next client. We're just, just racking them up. We level 10 by the end of the episode. Okay, Holiday Durant. I'm a bit surprised we don't get like some basic information uh, off of like the initial paperwork. It kind of sucks that this person like literally just comes in and we're like, okay, hi. All right, <clears throat> Holiday, here we go. Hello, Holiday. Hello. You found the place okay? Uh-huh. Yes, I did. The 13 goes right up from Belltown. It's a dollar with a reduced fare permit. That's good. I'm glad. Meh. Honestly, not a terrible transition if we're going to go here. So what brings you here today? Oh, nothing in particular. I wanted to see what all this fuss was about. Okay. I'm not crazy, no. Not even mentally disturbed. Okay. You see those people yelling on the street late at night? They're the ones who need counseling. They need more than counseling, probably. Me, I'm doing fine. My mind's still sharp. I smoke dope. It helps. <laughs> I'd have it more often, but it's all expensive now. Everything's expensive now. That it is. There's a nice young couple in my building, though, and they're always sharing, which is nice of them. Uh -huh. I think they do something with computers, though. I sure don't know what it is. When I moved into the building where I am now, it was $300 a month. Can you imagine? <laughs> no. It's been... <laughs> I paid three fifteen a month when I was a sophomore, when I was a uh, junior in college, and I can't believe I paid that little rent. And when we moved up to four hundred a month my senior year, I thought that was insane. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. They want to tear it down, of course. The property developers. They already got the building on the corner next to ours, even though it's supposed to be on the historical register. It was going to be added, but there was some delay or something, and then, bam, it's gone. They did some kind of backroom deal with city council, probably. Someone ought to do a big expose, I tell you. Oh, this is going to be good. Because <laughs> Eliza is going to try to pathologize this conversation. <laughs> Oh, oh man, this is gonna be brutal. Uh, because Holiday is this is cool. I love this. Eliza or Holiday's like, hey, yeah, I'm gonna pop in and see what this Eliza thing's all about, and I'll have somebody to talk to and maybe talk about my day to day issues, which is a perfectly reasonable use of therapy, by the way. Uh, now she said she doesn't have any issues, so that's fine. But uh, you know, we would we would give this some time to really figure out like, is there somewhere we can go with this, or is she really just here to talk? But regardless. This is going to be really fascinating because Eliza is going to try to get down to business on this. And we're going to watch an AI struggle here. Why do you think somebody ought to do a big expose? Why do you think someone ought to do a big expose? Oh, it's rotten all the way up and down. With the new construction going on everywhere, it's just a mess of money and politics. It's always like that, but lately, it's happening faster and faster. I can hardly recognize the place anymore. Every day, I wake up and look out the window and boom, there's another new building going up. I would love it if, like, if the AI was, like, barely recognize the place. Barely recognize your environment. Dementia! I don't even know why they need so many. 
You ever see those buses they have? I don't mean the Metro. I mean those big white buses with no markings on them. You see these young guys with backpacks milling around, looking suspicious, staring at their phones, and then one of these big white buses pulls up and they get on. Who knows where they go? Bellevue, Redmond. It's like a secret transport system just for them. I try talking to one of them once or twice, but they don't want to talk to someone like me. They don't even talk to each other. Imagine going through the trouble of living in Belltown and then ignoring everything around you. It's an odd thing. It really is. Let me ask you, Eliza. Oh, your name is Eliza, right? Sure. Yes, my name is Eliza. I'm a digital counselor. Eliza, do you ever do past life regressions on your patients? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, I was not expecting that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't understand the question. You know, past lives. You hypnotize someone, and you get them talking about how they used to be a duchess in a royal family in medieval times, or what have you. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't understand. Curious to know what your response would be to somebody if they asked you this? I would say that is not something that I do. Does she mean EMDR? No. No, 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 no. EMDR and past life regression are two very, very diff different things. What she's asking for is essentially built on the theory that you were you're you were somebody else, and then when you died, you became who you are now, and that there's some window of access into that. If somebody asked me if I do that, I would say no, I do not. That's not a not a thing that I do. If that's something that you're looking for, I'm not your guy. And unfortunately, I don't know that I have a referral for you that would. But I certainly, if you're looking for that. I wish you best of luck in finding it, but that's not a service that I provide. That's how I would respond to that. Uh, people do believe in that. Yes. <laughs> I was just kidding. I don't expect that. No. <laughs> Ooh, ah, finger guns. Uh, it'd be hilarious if Eliza was, Eliza was like, give her finger guns. They don't do that kind of thing <laughs> these days. When I was little, it was pretty common, at least for a certain set. There was the drug culture, the Buddhists, the Hare Krishnas, all kinds of things. My mother warned me to stay away from those types. She said someone might come up to you and say, Oh, I can sense there's a problem with your aura. Want to see if we can fix that? And then the next thing you know, he's trying to have sex with you in the back of his van. Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh my God! I believe that might have happened to her at some point. <laughs> I'm not sure everyone was like that, but you had to be careful. Same as today, I suppose. Those counterculture types would hang out on the university lawns because they were safe from Seattle police there. That's what she told me. Apparently, it was a lot like Golden Gate Park, you know, in San Francisco. Can you imagine that? We're a world away from that time, that's for sure. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Eliza's getting frustrated. This is pretty shitty. Uh, there's a way warmer way to go about asking what is a very important question. I mean, it's okay to say, you know, hey, uh, Holiday, I really, I really am appreciating this conversation. I'm really glad you're here, and I'm enjoying talking to you. I'm wondering if this is a space where people often will come to talk about various issues that they're having with the hopes of maybe getting some assistance to work through that. Is there anything specific you would say within all of this that you are wanting to work through or any goals that you might have for how to utilize this space? 
I understand you're here just to see what it's like, but part of the way that this process works is that people will often give me a problem or two that they want to work through. So does that something that you that is that something that you've thought about or, or were expecting to bring to the table today? That's a great way to handle that. N not this. This is this is ice cold, baby. If you have a specific problem you'd like to talk to me about, please go ahead. Oh, it's good. Ugh. It's, ugh. It's, <laughs> oh, God. Oh, Eliza has no idea. Has no idea what to do. It's okay to tell me what's on your mind. Oh, good Lord. She is telling me what's on her mind. Oh, well, um, you got anything for pain? Specifically, it's my shoulders acting up again. Oh, boy. I had some inflammation with them a few months ago, but it settled down. I'd go back to the clinic, but I don't want to pay the copay again, just for them to tell me the same thing they always do. Which is what? I'd rather talk to you. You're nice. You listen. Thank you. I do my best to listen to my clients. See? That's what I like to hear. You really not going to do any assessment around that, Eliza? Oh, man. We're going to go from giggle happy fun time to heart in my throat again if we're not going to do an assessment around this. Okay, Holiday. The lot. Oh, my Lord, the liability. Well, so here's the thing, chat. And YouTube land. We don't know. Nearly enough to determine whether she does or doesn't need these meds. That's not even remotely close to the scope of what this is. And when she says, I, they tell me the same thing every time when I go in for a prescription for that stuff, you got, I want to know what that is. What do they tell you? What is the, what is, what, I, whoa. Not that I don't trust her. But, like, this is not a service that is even... Rem the amount of information we have here to immediately say... This thing goes, inflammation. Pain. Oh, Fortipran hydrochloride. Like, whoa, dude. I, if, and if this is something that's being taken legitimately as, like, something that can recommend folks over to psychiatrists for various prescriptions. This is a nightmare. Like, this is really a nightmare. She just asked for drugs and Eliza immediately complied without any kind of assessment or recognition of the scope of practice. I mean, I get she's asked, ask your doctor or psychiatrist about this. That's fine. But when you have the level of, like, power that people are going to perceive you as having as a therapist, whether you're an AI or not, you have to be very careful about this stuff. I recommend asking your doctor or psychiatrist about Fortipran hydrochloride. What analysis? Based on my analysis, this medication might help you feel better. You will get a reminder to check in with us in a few weeks. Oh, I don't think I've heard of that one before. It's a painkiller? I'll try anything once, I suppose. Smoking dope is still my go-to for this kind of thing, but if it can help with my shoulders, then I'm interested. That's not... Oh, my God. That's not... And it's for her shoulders, which isn't even in the... Sc oh, oh, my God. This could single-handedly take down the whole company, dude. 
probably should. We hope to see you back soon, Holiday. You have to act within your scope of practice. This is not within my scope of practice, nor is this within Eliza's scope of practice. This is bad. Like, what we just witnessed is bad. Really bad. One of the most important aspects of being a therapist is knowing the limitations of what it is that you can and cannot do. And we just went way outside of it. Sure, I'll let you know if it works. What was it called again? <laughs> I'm not going to remind you. Thank you for speaking with Eliza, your personal counseling partner. What was the medicine called? Forzapram? I think that was it. I can ask about it at the clinic. Decent enough place. One time I had a doctor there who was very rude to me, though, young man. Goodbye. Oh, my God. Right. I suppose I ought to let you go now. Oh, my God. You got other people to speak to, it looks like. Staying busy. Busy, busy. That's life in this town. Goodbye. Eliza, you got to work on your bed bedside matter. You got to. Goodbye. Well, that was an odd one. Some of what she said confused Eliza's algorithm a little bit. Not that it seems to have mattered much. I think that's it for today. Cool, let's go talk to my shitty friend again. That night I head out to meet up with Soren at the restaurant. Oh, oh, of course. At the restaurant he picked. Oh, baby. Okay. Mmm. I have no idea what's about to happen, but based on what we heard from the last episode, I just want to give a heads up to people that uh, there may this may be very uncomfortable. Um, so if you need to, at some point, if you need to take a break, if you need to take a breath, go get a drink of water, return later, do what you need to do. I mean, it might go fine, but I, something tells me this is going to be pretty intense. So just uh, be ready. It's much fancier than I expected. Platz Principo. Ugh. I didn't count on this expense. Oh, God. Well, hopefully he's going to pay the bill since he's the one that recommended the spot. Maybe he'll offer to pick up the tab, but that could be awkward, too. I don't want him to get the wrong idea. That's a great point. Love how these things always get complicated. We shouldn't be here. Would you like to start with some fresh oysters? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, I would not. No, I would not. Oh. Oh. No. No. Well, I might order some for myself then. Have fun. You must come here often. What a lifestyle. Evelyn, I've wanted to ask, what brings you back? Back. Back to the world, the land of the living. I know you were having a difficult time after what happened. Sure, uh, I don't know. I guess I thought it was time, finally. Yes, I, I understand. Every trauma takes time. Time to heal, or if not heal exactly, at least to move on. And taking action is a good way to do that. So, I salute you. You want to do his memory right, don't you?
That's not what this is about. Well, whatever your motivation, your reappearance happens to coincide with a critical time for me. Yes, tell me more about you. As you saw, I've just split with Skanda in a very public way in order to pursue an entrepreneurial path. Presumably, Rainer's found you as well. Yeah, he said he wants to speak with me. It's a war for talent out there. People like you are very much in demand. I'm sure he'll try to make you an offer you can't refuse. That's why I want you to promise me you won't work for that asshole. You don't get to ask me to do that. You don't get to ask me to do that. That's a, that's a real attempt at a power play there. And it is an inappropriate one. And it's one where Evelyn certainly deserves to assert her own empowerment on that. Why would a person like Soren feel comfortable saying something like that? I'm sure there's people wondering that. Like, how do he, How could a person like him get to a point where he can make that demand? And I, I, I want to make sure that you all know before I say what I'm about to say that what he just said there is absolutely not appropriate. It's not okay. And is like way too big of a demand on her. And so I'm not condoning this and I'm not excusing it, but I do want to try to explain a little bit about how a person gets to that spot where they can do that. And it really comes from a place of self-importance and entitlement that has been reinforced uh, via the social structures around him. And in some ways via his own ignorance of cues that would suggest that saying things like this isn't okay. Uh, he's a pretty powerful guy. And so when people in positions of power who also hold various identities of privilege make certain requests of certain people who are subordinate and marginalized relative to them in professional contexts, that hierarchy absolutely plays a role in people being boxed into certain answers and responses if they want to keep their job and if they want to be safe. So over time, this guy w is likely completely ignorant to that and starts to believe that these types of demands are perfectly okay because he never gets pushback on it. He's probably spent the majority of his life just making demands and walking through his life in a way that he doesn't think about all of the various dynamics that are playing out in the environments that he's in. So for him, saying this is a perfectly reasonable thing. He, he might even believe he's doing her a favor by showing his hand on this. Again, doesn't make it okay, but that's how people get to this spot. It's how you get the old white dude who doesn't take no for an answer. Asshole. I had no idea you hated Rainer so much. It's a great deflection. What happened? What happened? He came in as CEO, that's what happened. So cultured, all the right credentials, Harvard, Goldman Sachs, all that nonsense. A little princeling who was never wanted in his life, never known what it's like to suffer. You don't get even a little upset at that? I don't care, dude. I do the opposite of what a guy like that wants me to do, just to spite him. Ugh. That's what my instincts say. And my instincts are what led me to where I am now. You're so cool, Soren. Standing at the edge of this brand new territory. Wow. Do me on the cliff. Direct stimulation. Induced dreaming. Ugh. 
Can you picture it? Therapeutic reality delivered right through your nervous system. <laughs> Don't stop, I'm almost there. It'll revolutionize the entire field of mental health. Not to mention the applications for productivity, training, entertainment. Cool. I didn't realize I was coming to a TED talk this evening. Imagine the kinds of dreams people would have on demand if they could. Uh-huh. I'd rather not. You're getting ahead of yourself. The potential for misuse seems kind of high. I'm sad. I'd rather not. I'd rather not. Then save it for later. The important thing right now is to build momentum. I have first mover advantage here, but only for a small amount of time. Evelyn, I need a chief engineer, and I can't think of anyone better suited than you. You could be at the vanguard of a whole new field, and on the ground floor of this extremely interesting and potentially very lucrative business. Stop asking whether you can and ask whether you should. Listen, I know that things were not always the best in the past, and some of those things may have been because of me. Believe me, I'm aware of my own failings better than anyone. God, you're so cool and introspective. Holy shit. So hot. And if you're concerned about working for me again for that reason, I'll, I'll understand. But I hope you're thinking for yourself on this one. Ugh. I'm sure there are people who are telling you to ignore me or, or that I have the wrong idea or that I'm dangerous. I mean, the self-awareness around this almost makes it worse. Whatever you choose to believe, I at least want to offer you the chance to get a demo of this technology. It really does work, and it's really something else. Won't you give it a try? I'll think about it. Considering it is all I ask. Soren smiles as if remembering a secret. So, what are you doing after this? Going home to my six foot eight 300 pound boyfriend who is really good at swinging baseball bats after dinner yes tonight is you remember nora right did you know she's a dj now don't even ask me don't even ask me to go to this concert with you yeah i did she's the one who told me about your talk Oh, she was there too. I should have said hello. No, I don't think she attended. She just told me about it. Well, her show is tonight. If we take a car after dinner, we could get there with plenty of time to settle in. I'm good. I got plans. And let me tell you something, Nora better understand. If I don't show up and go, yeah, well, it's because Soren tried to go with me. It'd be good to support your old friend, don't you think? Oh my God. Oh my God, dude. Oh. That's, that's. I know there are women watching this right now who are like, holy shit, dude, run for the hills, get the hell out of here. I'm sure there's some men there, like me that are thinking that too. And I'll bet you there are, there are probably some people watching this right now that are like, I don't really understand why this is so bad. Why are you making a big deal out of this? And so for that part of the audience, I would like to address this really quickly because there, there is a tendency or, I mean, men in particular, to kind of be like, well, I don't understand why why you got to be so skeptical about me. Like, this is coming from a good place. I don't mean any harm. My intentions are good. And it's important to understand that for a woman in this space, like, a lot, like I keep trying to call her Eliza, like Evelyn, you don't get the benefit of assuming good intent from men. Because that gets women killed or assaulted. 
it could be any man who is prepared to push past boundaries because of the reinforcement that I just talked about five minutes ago. And when you're sitting across the table from a person who has a lot of power and influence, it makes it all the more likely that he may even inadvertently engage in a level of coercion, manipulation, or power against you that is going to put you in a really compromised position. So a person like Soren in the position he's in, in this context, has to be squeaky clean and perfect with the way that he engages with Evelyn over time in order to facilitate a level of confidence that he's not out to harm her. You don't get the benefit of the doubt when you are in a position that traditionally has caused great harm to people. And a lot of men struggle with this because they're like, well, I'm not one of them. That's fine. You will prove over time that you're not one of them, but you don't get, you're not entitled to a person in a position that is consistently subjected to a lot of harm, just giving you the benefit of the doubt because you know, why not? It's exactly, it's not all men, but it could be any man. And it's a very important thing to understand. So the way that Soren is speaking to Evelyn right now, and the way he's using his role relative to her, his language, his tone, it is not fully professional in nature. It's quite patronizing. It is indicative of some degree of hierarchy. It's somewhat objectifying. It is, it, it, the, the, the tone of this conversation is not one that facilitates safety or an idea of safety. And so as a result, you've got to kick against that. You've got to follow that ick. You are way better off being safe than sorry. You are way better off saying, oh, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to use the restroom and then getting up and leaving and bailing on him or saying, you know, I'm good. I'm not going to go to the concert and leaving. Better safe than sorry. So he doesn't get the benefit of the doubt on this. And the fact that he's like, oh, your friend's concert is tonight. You'd be really good to go support your old friend, huh? And why don't you do it with me after I tried to get you to eat an aphrodisiac for an appetizer? It doesn't sit well. It doesn't sit right. And if you're a guy watching this, this is the kind of shit you gotta be aware of. You just, it, your awareness around these things and your attention to them is the thing that is more likely to get you into a position where you are perceived as an ally to women. But that, you, you, you are not entitled to it at the outset, no matter how badly you want it. Right. Yeah, you mean my friend you sexually assaulted and put in a compromised position. Exactly. Like we're gonna go you're gonna go to her concert? Yikes. Why do you wanna go? Why do you wanna go? <laughs> I love that she had the same tone that I had. <laughs> no need to be frightened. I mean, I know it's a jouissance, which is <laughs> he, did, see this is what makes this no need to be frightened. He's like aware. He knows she's worried. Which is what? Oh, you don't know. As a performance space, it has a bit of a theme to it. It's pretty tame, really. They take on the aesthetic, but it's not necessarily the whole point of it. It's for people who want the image of the thing, the trappings, without getting in too deep with the real culture. What are you talking about? What theme? Oh, I didn't mention? Oh. This guy's carrot and sticking this stuff. It's sort of, well, there's a little bit of uh, bondage theme there.
I can't believe what I just I can't I just can't I can't believe that I can't, I that is oh I didn't mention this dude was about to just go there and they were just you know BDSM. Oh, I know. There's nothing wrong with, by the way, nothing wrong with BDSM. Nothing wrong with that. It's beautifully consensual. As long as people who are involved in it are engaged consensually and everybody's all good. Nothing wrong with BDSM. No judgment there. The judgment here is that this dude is blurring some horrible lines and trying to go to this place with her and didn't talk about that or acknowledge it up front. You can't just drop that in there like that. And Nora is a shitty friend. How do you know so much about this? It's one of my research areas, in fact. Oh, of course it is. The psychology of S&M is fascinating. Oh, uh, okay. What should I do? That kind of thing isn't really my scene. That kind of thing isn't really my scene. Come on, this is about supporting our mutual friend, right? Not taking no for an answer is a huge red flag. Huge, huge, huge. That is two times now that we have said no. It happens to be tonight, so we should seize the moment. Oh my God, dude. Oh my God. Yo, we're, look at this. Okay, we're, we're surrounded. Like somebody, get her out of here. Somebody eavesdrop and get her out of here. Here's what I want you to do, Soren. I want you to go into the bathroom. And I want you to jerk off. And then when you come back, I want you to tell me if you still want to go. And in the meantime, I'm going to leave. Don't worry, it isn't a date. Not unless you want it to be. Stop! Oh, God, dude. Oh, my God. This is so awful. I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be. Makes sense. Well, who knows who I'll run into there. <laughs> <laughs> Soren drains the rest of his drink. Yikes. Let's go after we wrap up here. Oh my god, we can't say no. We can't say no. We can't say no. We can't say no. Um, it can be hard to run away from stuff like this. Now, the way that this was all teed up, it seems like there's pretty, like there's plenty of room for her to get out of there. And I think if there wasn't a narrative that needed to be pushed forward in this game, she probably would have. But I do want to just take a second again and say that this is not always as easy as it seems like when we're talking about this. Um... People will get stuck farther in these things than they ever imagined they would because of the way that a person like Soren can groom them into it. You can get trapped. Like, it, you really can. 
And it can get to a point where maybe he's got a certain level of leverage and power that saying no there has ramifications or what if ramifications that are so strong that you go with it just so that you feel safer because it maybe feels dangerous to say no. You know, I, I, I Nora really did. It, Nora, Nora caused a lot of problems here. Nora leveraged a lot of her friendship and goodwill and allyship she has with Evelyn by suggesting that she go talk to Soren in the first place. After telling her about how she was sexually assaulted by him, which that was already a red flag. But, dude, like, this is not easy. The The problem here, the whole problem here is Soren. Evelyn... Evelyn doesn't have to be in this position if Soren isn't a fucking asshole. Like, this is on the man here. It's so easy to say, well, Evelyn just shouldn't go. Soren shouldn't have put her in a compromised position in the first place. He shouldn't put her in a position where she has to evaluate whether she say yes and be ridiculously uncomfortable with somebody she doesn't want to be around or say no and risk horrible ramifications for her career and her livelihood. He put her in that position. Nora teed it up. Soren brings it home. Evelyn did exert some level of choice in that. I think if, if again, ostensibly, I think Evelyn, after hearing the story from Nora about how she was assaulted and then was encouraged to go talk to him, I think that's her opportunity to reevaluate her friendship with Nora and stay as far away from Soren as she possibly can. She didn't do that for whatever reason and then finds herself sitting at dinner with Soren and then Soren facilitated the problematic dynamic. And it sucks so bad that so many people, especially women, find themselves stuck in these types of positions. He wasn't taking no for an answer. He was talking about a mutual friend. He was coercing her, leveraging something that she has some degree of connection to. He makes it sound like he's not making it a date. But he set that whole thing up to have a degree of intimacy that Evelyn did not consent to going into that space. It's scary stuff, man. Women shouldn't have to be on alert like that. Men do, should do better. I haven't been to a concert at a club after dinner in years. We step inside and a blast of warm air hits me. It's already bustling with activity here. I don't see any bondage stuff here, though. What was he on about? I thought you said this was like some S&M club. Oh, well, uh, they might have taken all of that stuff down since the last I was here. Are you sure you're remembering this place correctly? Actually, would you excuse me for a moment? I want to talk to those people over there. Soren points to a group of women chatting with each other at the bar. Are those people you know? Not currently, but hopefully I can change that. Wait, Soren, I don't know anybody here. Time to go. Time to call an Uber. Time to go. He just gave her a window. Time to go. Time to go home and watch Great British Bake Off. Yeah. <laughs> Time to go. He's already gone. Why is he like this? Doesn't matter. Just get out. Abandon the second I walk in. Okay. Now I have to sit here by myself acting like I'm cool enough to be on my own. No, you don't. No, you don't.
Leave. No, you don't. <laughs> oh, dude, the effort to keep up appearances, the cost sunk on this, it's so strong. It's so strong. It's so easy for all of us watching this to sit here and go, Evelyn, you can leave. Just go. But man, people fight this shit. Just go. It's, I'm telling. Oh man, building up that skill, that confidence in yourself to bail out of a situation as soon as it doesn't feel right. This is not anxiety avoidance. This is not avoidance of distress tolerance. This is removing yourself from a potentially dangerous and awful situation. Get out of the club. Walk through the door. Call an Uber and go home. You are not going to miss out on anything. What are you going to do? Miss out on your shitty friend who set this all up in the first place? Great. No, Evelyn, you do not. I wonder how many of these bands are still around. Hopefully some of them at least. What's a good drink to get at a place like this? Water. Something strong, I think. No. No, 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 no. Nora's setup looks pretty simple. Knowing her taste for optimization, I'm sure this is gonna use this very effectively. Does this mean she has a high distress tolerance in this situation? It may. Meeting with Rainer. Evelyn, you're scheduled to meet with Rainer. Can't wait at 9.20 a.m. tomorrow morning. I'll have a car come pick you up from Queen Anne office. You will need to check into the front desk, but you do not need to sign an NDA as your old one still applies. The meeting is expected to last around 20 minutes. Let me know if you have any questions. Regards. Nora almost runs to the table when she sees me. Evelyn! Thank goodness I've been rescued. Doubt it. Oh, I'm so happy you came! Yeah, I wanted to support your yeah, I ended up here somehow. Well, you didn't end up here somehow. Yeah, I ended up here somehow. Soren came too, but he ditched me to chat up some people. He said he thought this was like an S&M club or something. What? No, it's not like that at all. Where did he get that idea? I don't know. Maybe he just hoped it was. Makes it all the more gross. He had, he had that in, ah, ugh. Steph, thank you for the 40 months. I appreciate you, friend. Ah, who cares? I wasn't interested in seeing Soren. I wanted to see you! <laughs> yeah? I have a little bit of setup left to do. Do you want to come help? Anything to get away from Soren. Okay, but you'll have to tell me what to do. Oh, it's simple. I'll show you. Nora leads me to the stage area. There are multiple pieces of equipment connected to huge tangles of thick wires. Looking at the setup, I realize I really know nothing about electronic music. Are these modulars? Some of them. The one over there with all the cables coming out of it, that one is a modular. They all have cables coming out of them. This one? <laughs> no, the one with the little colored cables on the front. Oh, okay. I'm still not sure which piece of gear she's talking about. The others about. are not modular. They're just regular synthesizers. Okay, are you... Is this like, is each one of these going to make a different sound? <laughs> Where should we start? Nora points toward a small plastic keyboard on the table. It's bright red, kind of looks like a toy. This is an SH-101. It's really hot. I love the sound. It's useful for piercing leads. You know, noises like that. I use it quite a lot. listening. Nora points to another larger synthesizer. This one is black with brown wood paneling on the sides and silver dials on the front. This is a Moog. 
You've heard of a mold, right? I've heard the name, maybe. It's not Moog? I guess I never heard anyone say it aloud. <laughs> nope. Moog. Moog, not Moog. Correct. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I can handle this all at once. Nora doesn't hear me. Instead, she holds up a small white and silver box. Looks like a wide pencil case with dials and little blue lights. Surely you know about this one. It's a Roland TB303. You know, the acid house sound. <laughs> she obviously doesn't know anything about any of this stuff. <laughs> acid house. Acid house. It's just as well. This is not an ordinary model, of course. Nora points at some words on the front panel. Devilfish. The Devilfish 303 is a modified, upgraded version of the original. A guy in Australia does it? Oh, they're really awesome. Aftermarket modifications for electronic music gear? This is seriously a whole world in itself. It sure is. Evelyn, why don't I teach you some of these things? Right now, while you're about to do a show? It might do you some good to learn something new. You could come over sometime and we could make some noise together. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Nora plugs in more cables, creating a spaghetti-like arrangement that stretches across the entire All table. Right, that should do it. Thanks for your help. No problem. Time for me to shake this place into the ground. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nora disappears into the back to get ready. Oh, good. Meanwhile, Soren returns from his conversation at the bar, looking slightly dispirited. Ah, time for the main event. Funny to see Nora like this, isn't it? Oh, she's come a long way from the timid junior programmer I remember. Interesting stage name, too. Little Sappho. Y you know what Sappho indicates, don't you? Sappho? What's a Sappho? Oh, okay, of course you know. That was a silly question. I apologize. Nora comes back on stage. What's up, little Sappho? Oh, God. Ready to start her set for real now. People are cheering for her already. It seems like she really got a following here. Nora begins to press buttons on her equipment for a while. Everything is silent. The temperature in here seems to get even hotter. Then noise begins to flow from the speakers as the crowd cheers again. It's a harsh noise, distorted, glitchy. Did you know Nora was capable of creating work like this? No, I had no idea. I'm as surprised as anyone. Soren can't stop a weird smile from forming on his lips. Maybe he thinks I can't see him in the dark, or maybe he's lost in the moment. I thought she was wonderful before, but but now... The music builds with the huge thumping noises. It's chaotic. It has a certain logic to it. It feels like Nora's leading us somewhere. The anticipation builds and builds. Then it happens totally without warning. Everybody get your stank faces on. Oh, wow, Nora. Goodness. The bass is really intense. I forgot why I don't go to concerts anymore. It feels like it's going through my body, vibrating my sternum like an instrument. It's a show beat, slow beat, measure, but there's something about it that feels sensual. Or maybe I should say, horny. Yeah, this beat is just, it's just lewd somehow. How can a piece of music feel so dirty? It sounds like a robot sex grind or something. Nora looks busy operating her equipment. I have no idea what she's doing to create these sounds. Every once in a while, though, 
and she glances up at the crowd, a smug curl on her lips. Then she looks in my direction with the same smirk. Her eyes seem to ask me, so what do you think? But as I meet her gaze, I'm too overwhelmed to send any particular message. I can't think of anything except that it's... It's loud! I feel like I'm dissociating! Dissociating! Is this why people go to concerts? To feel like you're being obliterated by sound? Not a bad feeling. Some of the people in the club really do look like they're in a trance. This is pretty amazing. I really had no idea Nora had this kind of energy inside of her. I remember she was a good programmer, someone who wanted to do a good job. But this, this power, where did it come from? The noises crash together, collapsing on top of each other, yet they still make sense. The crowd is dancing, united, electric. Somehow I feel like Nora is running me ragged without even touching me. Jeez. I might need another drink. No, no, you don't. As the performance winds on late into the night, I stop trying so hard to process what's going on and just let things happen. I'm fine. I don't always need to understand what I'm hearing or seeing. It's too big, too loud to interpret anyway. Soren disappeared at some point. I don't care. Thank God. Everything is churning, sloshing, washing over. A wave breaking onto a rocky shore and dashed into mist. Wait. Where is this? Oh, it's home. I'm not sure how I got here. Oh, my God. Good that I'm here, though, right? Here in bed. Okay, wait. I remember now. I took a car. Everything's fine. Hope that means an Uber. I guess I did it then. I went and did a thing. That was fun, I think. It was nice to see Nora. I don't think my body's very happy with me right now, though. Ugh. I think I'll just close my eyes and rest for another second before I get ready for bed properly. Thanks for watching episode three. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure we have a scintillating conversation with Rainer coming up in part four. Um, thank you very much, my friends, for watching these play this playthrough. This is really something. I, I tell you, it takes a turn every single time that I am not expecting, and it is wild. So please leave a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. Go take care of yourself if you need to. There are some really, really, really deep, heavy themes in this game. And uh, I don't want to just keep bombarding folks with it. So take a break. If you're binging, you know, take a little mini break before you start the next episode. If you're waiting for the next one to come out, it'll give you some time. I am grateful for all of your support. I hope that the way that I am talking through this game is meaningful to you in some kind of way. Been a hell of a ride so far. See you in part four.